taking in this external cost should be higher. We should be consuming less at a higher price, which should be familiar in the general case about bringing environmental externalities in. Not necessarily, they could have all different intercepts. I mean, you know, you could also say, like, well, what if this pollution curve, you know, the first 10 units, they're not polluting very much, you know, and then it starts to take off. You know, there, there could be many different shapes for the pollution curve. Um, I can't erase. Uh, so you could also say, you know, many small firms could do it right, but this one big firm, when it gets out here, they're going to pollute a whole bunch. Or you could say many small firms are going to pollute, but the big firm that can put this rubber on its smokestack, uh, you know, there's something where the bigger firm's going to pollute less. We have a whole bunch of different ways that the external costs are added into production. One way that, you know, just to motivate it is, is like, we, we made these marginal cost curves on a spreadsheet, and we could just think of, at different levels of production, how our society could uh, add in those external costs at different levels of production. So we had a loss triangle. This is the point where the firm is just using their own costs, and this is the point where society is having the external cost priced in. Right, I talked about what happens if the quantity that we get is more than the quantity that's optimal. And here's a loss triangle. Right? Our willingness to pay for this good is down here. But our variable cost, and here we're going to call this some, our social costs, as an area under this cost of pollution, cost of externality curve, our social cost is greater than our willingness to pay. So that's this loss triangle here. So we have a loss triangle where we're not at the efficient point. Every time we're not at the efficient point, it creates a loss triangle. Here we have a whole bunch of social costs that the firm's not going to internalize, but society is. So our cost of getting this triangle, that getting this pollution in our environment, would be described by this triangle. We like having cheap paper, but we have polluted rivers. We like having cheap lettuce, but there's not a lot of groundwater that's safe to drink in Salinas. So we have this loss triangle where our social costs aren't being borne. Um, so just to, while we're here to think about, suppose we're here, and we want to get to here. And in our first case, econ1 case, we need to get, we need some instrument to get us from this point to this point. If we had a Pigouvian tax, a Pigouvian tax tax on output to reduce production, what would that look like? Anybody want to say what a tax would do for this? This is classic econ1, this could totally be on the midterm. Anybody want to venture a guess what a tax would look like in this graph? Tax on the firm, tax on output. Every unit of lettuce you eat, we're going to have a tax on lettuce because of the groundwater. Every kilo of paper that you buy, we're going to have a tax on paper to reduce uh, river pollution. So because this is just a P and Q space, we're going to tax Q. Anybody? So we want to end up here. You want to tax on the firm. So we want the firm. The firm's just going to stay on their green line, right? They don't. The firm doesn't see this line. The firm only sees this line. So we're going to work with that line. We're going to work with this line to get to this point, right? We want to be at this Q. We're the regulator. We're like, I know how much paper I want to produce in the wake of externalities. We want to get to this point. Now, what do you want to say what the tax might look like? Right, so there's uh, an after, so what we call an after tax demand curve. And the height of this would be a tax, right? So the consumer is still going to pay this price, but the firm is only going to get this price. Okay? We're going we're gonna to tax the output. This isn't something we do in the real world as much as we teach in Econ 1, but uh, we tax output. I mean, we're getting to it, we'll talk about plenty. Let's tax carbon, you know? Let's tax carbon so we get to the point in terms of production of carbon that we want to get to. If we tax carbon, this imputed demand curve is not going to move down for the non-carbon fuels. It's only going to move down for the carbon fuels, right? Pigouvian tax. There's an after-tax demand curve. Demand after tax. The firm will only get the revenue after they pay this tax. So the consumer will pay up here. This tax will go to the government. And the firm's going to get down here. The firm stays on their marginal cost supply curve. The firm doesn't see this upper curve with its externality. Um, while we're in here, we might as well just get all messy and say there's a rectangle here, right? This is going to be the price that the firm gets in play in, in when there's a tax. And anybody want to say what this big box is while we're doing welfare allocations? What's that? Government revenue. Who said that? Yay. You took economics before. <laughs> tax revenue is this box, right? Uh, so our producer surplus will be down here. Our consumer surplus will be up here. And the government will be taking this much from the consumer and this much from the producer, right? And this burden is really uh, important to think about. And when we do public policy, who pays is really important, right? A lot of environmental taxes get sent to the consumer, get sent to reducing consumer surplus. So you can say, we're going to tax this polluter who's polluting our rivers or polluting the bay. But a lot of times, you know, that, that's largely going to get passed on to the consumer with these higher prices. When we talk about, uh, this is also getting ahead, but when we talk about the carbon tax, they think this box, if we tax carbon, is going to be colossally huge. Let's figure out a way to give the tax revenue back to people. We don't want the government to just get bigger by this amount of tax revenue by taxing carbon. We're mostly doing it to reduce the amount of carbon. We're not doing it as a way to generate tons of money. So what's the fair way to redistribute the tax revenue back to people? Take it out of their consumption of carbon. Make them pay like crazy to consume carbon fuels, but give it back to them somehow. That's uh, you know, equitable. So chapter 10, I'm going to walk through the, what they do in chapter 10, because it's a, a whole bunch of different ways to motivate this. Uh, but the main thing in chapter 10 is coming up with a marginal cost of car transportation, marginal cost of driving. Right? So some environmental economists went out. They said, what are all the different things that using cars as a way to drive our society? Certainly in California, we're just car crazy here. Right? The average person has two to three cars in California. 
my average family. Um, so we pay crazy amounts for infrastructure. We just built a $6 billion bridge that potentially is unsafe, it's leaking, it's totally awesomely beautifully cool, but $6 billion is a little, you know, we could get a lot of things for $6 billion. The Bay Bridge? Yeah, it's like not sealed up right, and like water's getting in there. There's all sorts, I mean, every week there's like another problem with the Bay Bridge. Yesterday was that they had uh, welded the deck together in a weird way, and so when there's an earthquake, the decks are gonna separate. You know, so the question is, if there's an earthquake, will people will drive over the next day and calculate it's like, we'll be able to fix it. But $6 billion, you know, this is like when I was talking about the public good last time, $8 trillion for the Persian Gulf. Like if we had spent $8 trillion on some other thing, like solar energy or some other, you know, if we spent $6 billion on the Bay Bridge, on Sending the bar to Marin or to San Jose or you know improving our we, we can't come up with the money for high speed rail right so but we spend an awful lot on cars like a colossal amount we don't think about it congestion is really big so people waste tons and tons of their time and productivity and traffic like you go to Silicon Valley Silicon Valley is a traffic jam right you think of like the 880 in Fremont is locked up that's a tons of super high paid people's productivity that's wasted in there uh, air pollution so this is interesting to say like their biggest costs here are not air pollution or climate change and these are generally the things that we're trying to change in this class so here's a much bigger estimate on the high estimate for air pollution but with our instruments of environmental economics we're trying you know and I talked about the I showed you the schedule of reducing the particulates in the air. Uh, we have other environmental things. Water gets polluted by, by motor oil. Uh, there's you know, noise from the freeway, 24 hours. Actually, this one is really interesting, accidents. Like Our society sees other things that are new technologies as dangerous, but the, we totally accept a huge amount of risk for the technologies that we have. So we, as a society, pay tons and tons of money for people dying and getting in wrecks. Like, every day, people are dying in car accidents, but we just think that it's normal. Energy security, so this is, a, this is what I was talking about last time. This is a carrier fleet in the Persian Gulf or whatever other, uh, what, what it costs us to import all this oil that we need to. And then parking, we allocate huge areas of our downtown to giant temples to cars, like multi-story places where all the cars can park right in the middle of downtown. That could be housing, could be uh, offices. So we have a whole bunch of different costs that we could think of. And here, what they did was they made it in cents per mile traveled, right? So this is you know, 10 cent, 13 cents per mile, this is 67 cents per mile. So it's an interesting way to take costs. Uh, we want to do it so we can draw a graph with it, but it's an interesting way to think about things like our external cost of driving in terms of you know, dollars per distance. Do you have any questions? Sure, absolutely. I mean, everything going up in this area. <laughs> uh, sure. So, and then we're going to do this in uh, the supply and demand for gasoline, right? So this is quantity that we're consuming of gasoline. This is the price of gasoline, right? So we get some elastic. They can make these curves. They have an elasticity, and they know where these points are at, so they know what the shape of these curves are. The supply elasticity and demand elasticity gives them an indication of what these slopes are at this point. Remember that elasticity is changing along the line, but if we know what a point is, we can back out what the slope would be. So here's this idea uh, for gasoline. There's the marginal cost to supply it, okay? And then we have some external marginal costs that we had in a table. A whole bunch of different things that's like consuming gasoline for transportation is causing in our society. So we have a much, we added these two lines up and we got a social marginal cost way up here. We added the external cost and the private cost to get the social cost. If we just pay at the pump for gasoline, we're not paying this true social cost, which is uh, more than twice as much as the price that we're paying, the, su the supply curve that we're seeing. So if we just want to look at this point, we're out here at private marginal cost. Oh, here it's private. And consuming out here, but our social point is up here. This is along the same demand curve. So we'll have a couple different points here. So this here, this one, is a whole bunch of extra costs that we're incurring as a society for being at this inefficient point. If we're at the efficient point down here, uh, we would be at where social marginal cost crosses. This is this uh, variable cost and producer surplus. And this was when I said the total willingness to pay for n additional units, right? So this is the amount that our willingness to pay has had to increase to get out there. And this big thing is all of these costs summed up to society. So in that table that was cost per mile, they were taking that from some total costs. So we have this area here that's these total costs, costs in hospitals, costs in building roads, costs in dealing with air pollution. And this as an area under the social marginal cost would be like a total, not a cents per mile, but a total societal value of all these costs. And as I said, here's this triangle. We, our willingness to pay as a society is different. Uh, we're, at the, we're at the wrong point. Our social point is here, and our private point is here. And this is extra costs that our society's paying for being at the wrong point. So at the, you know, the uncorrected sort of free market point that we're at, we're consuming way out at 140. The cost of society are much higher than the willingness to pay. There's a whole bunch of extra costs that aren't priced into the price that we're paying, so we're, we're willing to consume out here. If we added in all these external costs, we would shift in the amount of gasoline that we're consuming. These is billions of gallons of gasoline. Uh, so we would shift in the amount of gasoline that we would want to consume. And uh, we would make, as we shift in, this external cost would be going away. And we would be at a point where our willingness to pay would be equal to, this social, to the social cost. All right, I'm going to move on to this, uh, from social costs, uh, to, to this question of, um, Monopoly, oligopoly. This is the one that's not in chapter 10, but I still want you to know it. So uh, last time, I was talking a whole bunch about perfect competition in the last few slides. Um, but I want to talk about where we would change these assumptions and get to points that are not at this whole equilibrium point of quantity again. Look at where we can relax uh, these assumptions about maximizing welfare as well. So this is where we were at the end of last class. We, had, we were thinking about different markets, different situations where we have many buyers and sellers, where we have free entry and exit for firms to enter into uh, production. There's nothing keeping them from entering into a marketplace. And everything that everybody's producing is undifferentiated. They have a standardized output. It's a homogenous output. Like everybody's selling a similar enough product that can, that's going to be mixed into the same pool in the market. And everybody has information about costs. 
we don't have all the information about any sperm spots, but, but we have a supply curve, and everybody has information about what the prices should be. They can buy from different suppliers, so that everything's aggregated into one supply. So we're going to change these when we think about market power. Is there many firms entering the market, or is there just one firm in the market? And we have a few terms to go through. Uh, we start with perfect competition, and then we can have uh, monopolistic competition, where uh, we can have multiple prices. We can have oligopoly, where we have a few firms that can get together and get to an agreement on how to divide up the market. And then we have the case of monopoly, where we just have one firm supplying the whole market. So today I'm just going to mostly talk about monopoly. Next time I'll try and get back and hit some of these as well. But I want to talk about monopoly for a little bit. Uh, and it relates to a whole bunch of different, uh, different things in the class. So I want to motivate it well now in addition to supplement what's in the book. So the basic criteria of monopoly, one firm supplies the whole market. There's only one seller. It's the monopolist. There are barriers to entry. So if somebody else wants to sell in this market, there's some reason that the monopolist can keep them out. They might own the only mine of that mineral. They might um, have some government protection. We'll talk through the barriers to entry more extensively, but there's some way that other firms are kept out. And another way of saying this is there's no good substitutes. They sell something that's different than what other people are selling, and consumers aren't going to be able to substitute away from it. And there's not good information. So I try to motivate in a perfect uh, competition case that the price has information on cost, it has on marginal utilities of consumers, it has a whole bunch of price information embedded in the price. In a monopoly case, all that information in the price can get lost because the monopolist is able to manipulate the price and push it away from information about marginal cost and the, what marginal cost implies about inputs and other things. So let's just talk about barriers to entry. So how do monopolies get created? Or how do monopolies get maintained? Okay? So we try to motivate in the perfect competition case uh, that when there's economic profits, new firms are going to come in to this area, they're going to come into the market, and they're going to drive economic profits down to zero. That's why I spent a whole bunch of time talking about that time. But if the economic profits are not being driven to zero, if economic profits are maintained, there must be some way to keep other firms out. So one of them is legal restrictions. We could say uh, we have a whole bunch of these. We have one power utility that's going to service our electrical area. We don't have multiple electrical companies. We have one cable company. Right? The city of Berkeley makes a deal and says you can be the cable company in our area. Um, Congress or the legislature or the city government can say, uh, we authorize one utility here. We authorize one company to service here. Uh, one interesting one is um, solid waste. It's like the trash trucks that come around. Campus has its own garbage trucks, which is interesting. Uh, most everywhere in the world, there's giant mega corporations, Waste Management Incorporated. You'll see the WM on a lot of the trucks if you go to Oakland or you go to Richmond. And so they come into the city of Oakland and say, we're going to make a contract to pick up all your trash. And the city of Oakland and the city of Richmond doesn't own any trash trucks or the transportation. Berkeley is always an interesting place. Berkeley has decided for a whole bunch of reasons to keep their own garbage collection and uh, you know, maintain their own transportation independently pay the workers better and you know, maintain, some, maintain some sort of local control. But they're going to say only the city of Berkeley can collect things. Uh, another really big one is intellectual property. And this is the now, and this is the future, and this is super important. So we, in the Constitution, it sets up the idea of patenting. Right? So what a patent is, exclusive right to the inventor for 20 years. And we now live in a knowledge economy. We now live in an information, an information technology economy. And this is really important. Biotechnology, this is super important. What we've done is basically, by law, said you can have monopolies. You invent something, you can have a monopoly on it. Right? But this causes huge distortions in our economy when we say, oh, here, uh, drug companies, you're going to get billions of dollars to recoup your R&D by having a little monopoly on the drug when you invent it. We have societal questions like, is that right? Should something that's like a life-saving medicine subsidized by the federal government and research be subject to a monopoly? Interestingly, uh, the copyright laws have changed within our lifetimes. It's now 70 years after uh, the inventor of something has died. So the Disney Corporation, for example, right? huge global corporation, controlling ideas, controlling little kids' minds. My kids walk around the house singing Frozen. It's just like burned into his brain. right? Disney Corporation has 70 years of exclusive rights to Frozen. So as long as my kid's going to live, the Disney Corporation is going to own his right to, uh, you know, every time he hears that song, they're going to like get a penny. Um, so patents are really big. They're a way that we create, interestingly, you know, from the public policy stand standpoint, they're, they're a way that we create monopolies. Other really big ones are uh, controlling scarce resources. And this will come in at the end of the class when we talk about resources. There's a couple big companies that mine copper, gold, uh, diamond mines. So at one point, there was a family, the De Beers Diamond Mines in Southern Africa, uh, that controlled almost the world's supply of diamonds. Nobody had an engagement ring. The De Beers company hired a whole bunch of advertising and said, every person in America, when they get married, will have a diamond engagement ring. They like, invented this idea and sold it to Americans. And now everybody gets an engagement ring when they get engaged. That's a diamond. So like, a corporation that controlled the world's supply of diamonds convinced people that this was true. Um, another big one is predatory practices. So pricing below cost, coming in, shutting down smaller companies. This is stuff that we will learn, you know, we'll read about for like, Walmart moving into rural America. They can move 